And then I think I've sort of moved a little bit into the next slide, Wendy. Um, and as we talk about this, I'll try and bring in some nuance for the AMC side, because I, I sometimes wondered then when I was in the business, and even now, you know, what do you do as a, an association management company when the inevitable day comes that a client says, oh, we've decided to go standalone, or we've decided to look for something different or whatever. And then how do you manage that from your own business planning uh, perspective as well? So I sort of asked the first, second question. We'll talk a little bit about the third as we go through this today, which is really getting to a deliberate process for succession planning. Um, you know, when we do a CEO search, it's not unusual for most of the associations to not have a succession plan in place. And of course they say to us, you know, we're living succession planning now, we're working to find a new CEO. But what we always recommend when an organization's gone into a new CEO search without a succession plan, that the first thing they should do, or one of the first things they should do with the new CEO is to actually work on succession planning because there's no better time. Everybody's just come through a transition. It's fresh in their mind. They'll have thoughts about what went well and what didn't go well. And quite frankly, what they might've wished had been in place for that particular transition. The other nice thing about doing it then, um, nobody's feelings get hurt, right? So tip when some CEOs go to their board and say, hey, let's do succession planning. This is business continuity planning. We wanna do this for all the right reasons. Some on the board are gonna say, she must be getting ready to leave us. Oh my goodness, what are we gonna do? When in fact, you're just doing your job to make sure the association has the right documents in place. And then similarly, I've sat with a number of CEOs where the board came to them and said, we really need to work on succession planning. And understandably, the exec said, oh my gosh, they're not gonna renew my contract. What's going on? Are they going into executive session? And so again, doing it right after a new CEO is put in place is an easy time because it takes all the emotion out of it. It can build on the lessons learned during a transition so that it can help guide others for the future, but quite frankly, be a part of board orientation in the future, part of strategic planning discussions for the future, um, part of budgeting, because as you'll, you'll see in some of these slides and in some of my comments, you know, so much of good succession planning once you have the plan in place is actually making sure you're working to fully develop the staff that are engaged in the organization because the stronger they are, the more helpful they're capable of being uh, helpful in the transition, the more likely they might someday be the actual succession plan, meaning getting promoted into the role. On our next slide, we have um, a definition that Gartner, one of the consulting companies sort of uses, um, but they talk about it as being a true imperative. They talk about it as, reduce, as a way to reduce risk in your business operations. They talk about it being a part of your workforce development plan. You're recruiting, you're retaining, but also you're developing, as I just said. So I'll give you a moment to look at that uh, just before we move to the next slide. Some interesting statistics. A lot of people think it's urgent, right? And it doesn't mean they always get to it, but they appreciate the urgency. I'm not sure the 70% number hasn't ticked up a little higher lately. And so if you have that much of a C-suite in any organization thinking about moving on, you as the CEO, you as the head of HR have a real potential challenge they're obviously not gonna all walk out one day, but imagine if you had three direct reports and they all left within 12 or 15 months. The knowledge, the historical knowledge that they take with them is challenging to an organization. And, you know, we're seeing different things around business models. So sometimes this is the organization needing to let staff go. Um, and no matter how well done that is, not everybody always thinks about the knowledge capture that's needed so that knowledge and history doesn't completely walk out the door when there are transitions. But all of our boards should want a succession plan in place for the organization. 
Um, for those of you on the trade association side, particularly if you have bigger member companies, they most likely have something in place in their own organizations. And so they should understand this if you're teeing this up. So Jim, you mentioned the 70%. You think that might tick, have ticked up a little bit. Do you think that is a supply and demand kind of issue? Um, or, you know, or is it just the, may, I guess maybe it goes hand in hand, the opportunity. So I would say part of it is supply and demand. Uh, the good news is we're seeing fairly robust movement at the CEO level and throughout organizations. Sometimes when the, uh, there's movement at the CEO level, that does make the rest of the leadership team nervous. I don't know who's coming in. I don't know if I'm gonna to wanna to be here any longer. Are they gonna change the culture? Is the board gonna change the business model or the direction? Some of that is that these C-suite executives are involved in strategic planning conversations that are getting the organization to a very different business model. And if that's the case, it might mean the need for a slightly different or a very different leadership team, different competencies, different positions. Uh, I think some of it is quite frankly, you know, uh, thankfully we're on mostly on the other side of the pandemic, although this seems like the summer for the return of COVID, but um, you know, there's a lot of people who said, thank goodness I got through the pandemic. That took a toll on me personally and professionally. Um, I'd like to change something in my life. And quite frankly, the easiest thing, easiest thing to do is probably to change my job rather than moving my home, moving to another city or country. Um, you know, changing a job can sometimes be um, what's needed or what feels like um, the least complicated of things so that you feel positive that something's changed, that there's some momentum in life. And then I know we're all seeing associations that are challenged, right? Uh, business partners, industry partners may not have as much money to spend on exhibits or sponsorships. Members may not be renewing at the percentage they once did and Younger generations may or may not be joining as much as they did. And so thinking about um, revenue streams, and particularly if they're tightening up, some C-suite execs might say, it's time for me to go to another profession or not leaving association management, going to another professional society or trade association where they're doing better than the uh, group I'm representing today. So as we go through this, um, it is good stewardship. Ideally, it starts with the board or the board and the CEO, but particularly for those of you who are the CEO, um, making sure that the organization, if you choose to leave it, um, if for some reason you can no longer serve in your role, that there's something in place that guides decision-making. Um, often in a transition, particularly an unexpected transition, there may be no one on the board or staff or very few who say, I've been through a leadership transition before, I know what to do or I have some suggestions. So the more that there's the start of a playbook or an actual playbook, and sometimes you know these six succession plans will get as detailed as, if it's the CEO, here's what we need in an interim CEO, if one's necessary, here's how we're gonna guide the search we're going to do it on our own, or we've saved the money to invest in an executive search firm. Um, if we know we want someone from the industry, here are search firms that could help us if we want an industry person. Here are firms that do association work. It can get pretty detailed. And where it's an organization that's a little larger, where there are direct reports to the CEO, oftentimes it's in the best interests of the CEO to say, what would I do if any one of my leadership team members left me? They got a new job, they won the lottery, they've got to go focus on elder care issues. How do I capture the knowledge? Is there someone on the team that I can use? I guess I'm jumping to option number three on the far right, but is there someone on the team we can use this as a professional development opportunity where we can sit down and say, look, I'd really love to promote you into this role. I don't think you're ready yet, but I'd like to put you in the role in the interim now. 
going to work with you to develop you so that you're successful in this role. Um, and I hope that it'll help us keep you so that whenever this next person moves on, we might be able to promote you into the role at that time. Or if it's a larger team and it's the CEO role, CEO might say to the board, look, I know you probably want to do a full national or international search for my replacement, but we're also fortunate to have one, two, or three people on staff who we've never made any promises to, but we've always developed their leadership capacity so that you might consider them. Because sometimes the internal promotion, the internal candidate, uh, is really the right answer um, because of knowledge of the association the industry or the profession. So you can look at it from that perspective, but there should always be an overarching theme of how do we develop our team? How do we make sure we have the right talent that can help us in terms of a short-term unexpected vacancy or to fill the spot on a longer term basis? We will so if you don't have a plan in place, starting with, you can say the business issues and challenges, this might also be starting with your strategic plan, right? Particularly if you've just done it, you would have done some of this work. It's also talking to your board about risk. Um, not all boards are comfortable with it, particularly the larger you might get or your comp more, the more complex your revenue streams might become. Um, risk becomes a bigger and bigger thing. Um, if the profession is having workforce challenges, meaning bringing people in, or if it's being replaced by technology, how do you factor all of that into thinking about the CEO succession plan and or um, what's needed uh, for other positions on your team? Um, once you've sort of understood the baseline, then thinking about the talent you have. So, Again, I'll start with a CEO succession plan. Uh, you get recruited away to a great new opportunity. What is the right thing to do for after you've left and before a successor has been named? Now, in some instances, the board will say, well, we've been preparing Betty or Bob on staff for this. Uh, we're just going to promote them right in. That's a great answer where that's really the right answer. Sometimes the board's going to say, we don't know the staff that well. That was the CEO's job. Are there current performance evaluations in place or can the CEO on their way out advise us on the talent they're leaving behind? Is there anyone that we should be considering? But as you're doing this, you're also getting a sense of what are the strengths and what are the areas of development for your team members? And you can use that, yes, in the succession plan, but you can use that in your annual professional development planning for your team. Uh, one of the things, whether it's a large or small organization, do you have enough diversity of perspective around the table? Sometimes healthcare and medical societies, particularly larger ones, would like a member of the profession or someone who has deep knowledge of the profession on staff to guide, whether it's educational programming or other technical activities. Uh, sometimes it's just a shift in generations and membership. And so do you have staff that reflect the different generations in society? But ensuring that you thought very broadly uh, about the diversity of perspective, the diversity of the profession or industry that you represent is important as a part of succession planning. You may have- Hey, hey Jim, I'm, Jim, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you there? Please. Because we, um, Again, Carl Kirsch with an association management company. So a lot of times we'll get inbound clients, new clients that say, oh my gosh, we lost our executive director or this, these, thing, these things are short-term problems. That's why we need a new management solution. And they're thinking short-term going, yes, we just need to replace the attributes of the current situation. Where sometimes you want to say, well, once that's corrected, what do you, what do you want the attributes of your your person in three years? You know how to grow, how to change it. Um, can you build that into a succession plan, even with an internal staff member saying we're going to prepare you 
small staff organization, we want to prepare you to do more or have different perspectives than the existing, you know, leadership. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Do you know what I'm saying? Saying You are. I almost went off in one direction because uh, one of my other sort of soapboxes is I think association management companies are perfectly poised to provide interim CEOs and other staff talent to organizations that have an unexpected need. Uh, and I also think there's an opportunity when there's a CEO vacancy in the association sector that boards today should be thinking about AMCs as a true option versus let's just replace a CEO because we've always had a CEO. Let's perhaps move our organization into an AMC so that we can run better, more efficiently so that we can grow differently. It's not what you asked, but that is something I like to talk about a lot given my background. But in a succession plan, uh, whether it's for the CEO or for the staff, but especially for staff that report to the CEO or that you might develop for other or larger clients, I think you really should have a forward-looking view. So, all right, Jim's been with us three years. We know that he's really good with the board, doesn't seem to do as well on fundraising, and his clients currently have a different need for fundraising than typical association revenue streams. If this is gonna be a long-term need for other clients, we should make sure over the next three years, we get Jim out to the Association for Fundraising Professionals meetings or things like that, not just because it's good for Jim's development, but because it'll be good for our entire organization when he comes back and shares his new knowledge. But part of the succession planning, part of the professional development planning that should go with this should be a one, two, and three year lookout. So uh, here's a couple of examples of uh, different succession scenarios, right? We've talked a little bit about new CEO comes in, finds there's no succession plan in place. Perfect time to do it. Um, we've also talked a little bit about a current CEO wanting to proactively address this for all the right reasons, business continuity. Um, something may have changed significantly in the organization. We particularly are seeing mergers. We're seeing uh, new business models, right? We've gone from membership to now we have customers that include members. It's a different way of thinking. Our current CEO or our leadership team thinks a little more traditionally than maybe the shift we've just made. So how do we ensure that talent, uh, we're developing it on staff and or how are we educating the board so that when a CEO transition in particular happens, um, that they're thinking differently about what they need. Because as you all know, um, boards think your job is easy because you make everything look fantastic and fabulous, right? Your job, that's what your job is, right? So they don't always understand how complex. We've, we're working on a search where we're replacing a CEO who's been there 30 years. So we listened to the staff, we listened to the outgoing exec, we listened to the board and the search committee, and then we wrote the job description. And when we sent it to them, they literally fell out of their chairs because they said, we knew she did a lot. We had absolutely no idea she did this much. How will we find one person to replace her? And so you can use succession planning as a way to help the board understand not just the work, the totality of the work of the CEO, but the staff team as well, so that they truly have an appreciation for all that you're doing on their behalf. I think succession planning is really important if you are thinking about retiring in a year or two. You, I believe, have a responsibility as the CEO to make sure the house is as in order as possible, right? Job descriptions, org charts, benefits, uh, an active strategic plan and other things are in place that the board has been uh, taken through a year or two of true board development and training so that it's not left to the new CEO and that you start to have more active conversations. I'm not going anywhere for two years. You all know I just signed my last agreement, uh, but let's talk about this because I'm gonna run this place until the day I walk out the door, but I wanna prepare you and staff for the transition. And in a scenario like this, 
succession planning might then uh, include, let's bring in some CEOs who recently took their organization through a similar transition because they were retiring and to talk about what the board and how they reacted, how staff reacted, how to build some of that thinking, some of those emotions into rolling out a, a succession plan and an actual transition. I um, have spent some time recently with a couple of the CEOs we've worked with over the years and they've said, I've made the decision, I'm going in a year, what do I have to do? And they literally cared enough about the organization that they had started to script their own remarks for when they wanted to tell the board chair and the executive committee and the board they started to script their remarks for what they would say to uh, the staff when the board was comfortable with that. Um, they started to script things around talking points for the board on the transition. No, this is a very natural transition. So-and-so has really given their notice. We couldn't be more thrilled that they wanna go on and enjoy the rest of life. We've had a succession plan in place. We've got a solid business model. We're not going to miss a beat on behalf of the industry or the profession so that you're talking publicly about an organization that's going to run well during the transition. And then you could even go so far as to saying and there will be solid knowledge transfer uh, with the outgoing exec. There's a lot of boards who say, well, our exec's been here 10 years. Nobody else can do this job. And we have to have three to six months overlap between our outgoing exec and our new exec. And that could be really challenging. So using a succession plan to help educate the board that knowledge transfer is critical, but that such an overlap is probably detrimental to the success of the organization and the newly hired exec. And then of course, having a succession plan in place in case you get recruited away so that you can help the organization start the process of recruiting your successor you shouldn't necessarily be involved in the process versus making sure they have a robust process. Questions on these different scenarios and um, what some other groups may have done that I can potentially share. So Jim, how much overlap would you recommend between an orderly departure and a new person coming in, like how, about how much time? A day to a week. It's a really technical, and in an association management company setting, there's obviously some difference there, right? Um, you might be moving one staff member in your organization over to another client where there's not the tension that can sometimes exist in a transition another type of transition. Uh, just because it might be a day or a week of overlap doesn't mean you're not building other knowledge transfer in. Ideally, once a new CEO is announced, there should be weekly conversations between, it doesn't have to be every week, but one week could be with the board chair, one week could be with the outgoing exec, so that knowledge is starting to transition uh, so that the new CEO can be brought into any events like a board meeting uh, before they start, but without any uh, portfolio or responsibilities. Um, I just closed a search this morning, and of course, everybody wants to get the negotiations done so that the new exec can be at their board meeting literally two weeks from today, just to be able to say hello to the new board, to meet the staff, to hear the conversation, but not to actively participate. Yes, they might have thoughts, but there's no expectation other than start to come learn how we do what we do. Um, and certainly feel free to make suggestions to change it, but it's a gift when that can happen. And then it's not unusual if we have a day or a week of overlap that there's not some very short contract for the outgoing exec that the new CEO can draw upon to say, you know, Carl, I'd love it if we could do an hour a week for the next month or two months. I may not have any questions, but if I do, I'd love to know that I can learn from you, particularly small p politics inside the organization or the history on an issue that nobody else might be able to give me. So um, planning for knowledge transfer, minimizing overlap. We do have a group at the moment where the conference is mid-October. 
CEO starts Monday, September 9th. C existing CEO, outgoing CEO doesn't have to leave before the end of the year. And so what they've worked out is the outgoing CEO will essentially run the place until the conference and then publicly say goodbye. Uh, and then be behind the scenes to support the new CEO in anything they might need done. And the new CEO will still have the title CEO, but is comfortable uh, letting the new, uh, the old CEO make decisions through conference because everybody wants that conference to be highly successful. So Jim, um, Cece asked in the chat, she, she wanted to know if, if that overlap if you are bringing a CEO in from the industry who has no um, association experience, does that, does that change the overlap time frame? It can. I noticed that I was fortunate to be sitting in the sun. I'm not sure this is any better, but I've moved. <laughs> uh, yes. So if it's an industry or a member of the profession becoming an association exec or professional for the first time, Yes, a longer overlap can work and work well. Uh, but I'd say parameters need to be put in place. So on day one of the new CEO, who does the staff go to? They're gonna to wanna to get to know their new boss. They're gonna to wanna to build a good relationship. That can sometimes get lonely for the outgoing exec or sometimes uncomfortable. Uh, and so ensuring that staff really understand who to go to for what, for what period of time. Same for the board. You know, board members, whether they have agendas or not, could say, well, Heather ne never really agreed to do this, but let me see if I can get Jim to do this, right? And so how do you make sure none of that stuff happens in a way that it doesn't need to? So a longer overlap in this instance that you've mentioned can work as long as everyone's really clear on who's responsible for what, that the two execs talk constantly and say, by the way, Betty called me today and... Just want you to know this is what came up. I don't want you to be surprised, et cetera. Um, it can work well in that instance. I wanted to let everyone know that Wendy did say that she would post both the slides and a copy of this video tomorrow when she gets back into town. A lot of you were asking for the slide deck and I think that's gonna be helpful for everyone. So thank you very much, Jim, for sharing that with all of us. I think it's gonna be a big help for us and our boards. Yeah, absolutely. What questions? And I'm starting to scroll through the chat here. So, um, yeah, so tip exactly the death of a CEO is definitely not fun. It does happen. Uh, and so preparing for that is one of the reasons, particularly in a small association where so much knowledge might be within that individual that you've just lost. Um, there's the grieving that goes with that. And then there's the, how do we just do anything, let alone how do we do everything? Does this excite you more? Does this scare you more? Does this want you to start writing your your succession plan tomorrow? <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a template person, right? Is there something out there that we could reference to even get our our brain started on where we we might go? I don't know what resources GSAE has. Wendy can probably speak to that. Um, I do know that um, in the past, the American Society of Association Executives has had some templates. I know they're working on redoing a number of the templates they have. I think this is one of them that they're going to be rolling out next year. Um, board Source has had some material on this. Those are for more nonprofit boards than association boards, but there's still a lot that's applicable there. And then Harvard Business Review has done some stories that also include maybe not a full template, but key elements of a template that can be helpful and be adapted to any of our organizations. You have any suggestions, Tip? <laughs> Did I you mean, just on the research, Tip? What's on your mind? Mm -hmm. you I, I'm happy to provide mine. I'll I'll kind of take out all the you know important information and in terms of names and dates and all that. But 
And so that you'll have an idea of what I included. I I definitely looked at this as one of those exercises where you you scale to your size. Like I I went and got a bunch of samples from friends. That was the first thing I did, and I, and read, went to Board Source and read a, several articles. And and there were ones that were fifty pages long, and I was like, that's like I can't carry. I, I just don't think that's appropriate for our size. We're only eight staff and three million budget. So, you know, mine's about fifteen. And I think it, it gives a good roadmap without giving, without locking us into the board to any real set um, decision. And it's just knowing your board a little bit and finding that balance, I think is really important. You know, a 15 page document can be, can take time to get to. So if you start with a one page outline while you're working on the rest of it, at least there's something there that says, here are just the basic elements of a succession plan. Got to call the board, <laughs> got to alert the staff, got to think about the job description, got to think about if we're going to use an executive search firm or not, got to think about whether we need an interim CEO or not. Um, and so even if you don't have the answers, at least it's a list of things for the board to immediately consider. And that is helpful because most boards don't even have that. So even if they haven't thought through the answers yet, at least they have the questions or things to think about most. It sounds like you're describing a checklist. Okay, I start here. Template checklist, yeah. Yes. Okay, now I gotta go do this. <laughs> yeah, it's a start. Look, if any of you walked into your boards today and said, look, I'm leaving in 30, 60, 90 days, the board is going to say, oh, my goodness, what do I do? So anything you can give them to start and to say, look, I know I've got a lot to do before I go out the door, but I am committed to making sure you have a great transition. So we may not have the answers today, but executive committee, I'll make sure we have a weekly call for the next month and then we can make that once a month just on the topic of CEO succession just because we're in that moment in time. Um, but if you can then further develop it to 15 pages that says, hey, we've got three great senior staff and they should become a team as the interim CEO or one of them should be the interim CEO or quite frankly, they're all gonna be candidates. So we'd better use an outside interim so that all three of our internal staff have a fair shot at this. And here's how to find in external interim CEOs Here's literature about the benefit of using an interim if necessary. Um, you can build those out um, with each update of the plan. Hey, hey, Jim, as a student of unintended consequences, have you ever run into a situation where the chief staff officer says, we, we, need, to, we need to have a succession plan and the board is like, yeah, let's implement that right now and do our due diligence and see if there's like other options. Yes, unfortunately, that's why this is delicate. There's a very well-known uh, association CEO who literally said, uh, listen, I'm so happy. We've had a great run. I've decided that when my contract is up in two years, I'm not going to seek a renewal. There is nothing we need to do now because we have a succession plan in place. Uh, but I just want it to be transparent because we've had a great relationship, but I've decided what my timeline is. Some members of the board heard, I'm giving you my notice. He was not. He was just saying, I'm not going to come to you for a renewal. We don't need to address this now. We have a succession plan that says a year out we need to do that. I have another instance where a uh, CEO uh, had previously disclosed uh, an illness to the board um, and board members said, oh my goodness, was, will this work out, et cetera, what do we do? They sort of wanted to immediately go into transition and the CEO said, no, no, I'm being trans transparent with you, but I'm gonna be gone from the office a little bit for treatment, but I'm gonna be fine and I'm gonna be okay. I'm not giving you my notice. So Carl, yes, you've got to manage this very carefully if you're doing this for the first time or sharing certain news with the board. And sometimes you've got to just then spend a little extra time uh, reassuring them that no, you're not ready to go anywhere. You're just trying to make sure they're ready for the time. And in each of these instances, it took the board chair saying to the board, let me be clear, <laughs> they're not giving notice. 
we're all very happy. Thank goodness we have a succession plan in place. And thank goodness we have a great relationship with our CEO who's so transparent with us so that we can plan properly when the time comes. Well, I thank you, Jim, for your time today. And I thank you for sharing so much. It, you gave us a lot to think about. And you made um, wine and webinars just really, um, I, I think, informative and worthwhile. Um, I hope you'll consider coming back. You've got a lot of insight to share with us. Um, thank you. And I guess you're amenable to follow up questions if folks want to uh, reach out and contact you. So thank you very much for that. We really do appreciate it. And I remind you all, shameless plug, to uh, come to Savannah 2025, where we can really dive in even deeper for his workshops and seminars and explore the full value of Jim and all the value that uh, Wendy brings to the conferences for us, plus additional fun and, of course, lots of wine. So Thank you for your time today. Thank you for taking time out of your uh, busy day to join us. We appreciate all of you. Thank you for all you bring for GSAE and for all of our new visitors. We appreciate you. Uh, this is a tremendous way for you to plug in and get to know new people and network. Um, this is a tremendous way to really get to know people who are your peers and who can help connect you to a lot of opportunities within the association field. So thanks for all you do. Thank you, Wendy and Corin, for all that you do for, um, for, for us. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity. We appreciate you. On behalf of Wine and Webinars team, we value all of you and we'll see you the next time. Thank you very much. Good night.